Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our final webinar of the day on XI. Uh, for those of you that have watched some of our other webinars today, this is actually the sixth and final live webinar we're going to do. It's also the first time we're going to do this run through our XI webinar. So hopefully uh, you'll bear with us as we give this uh, a nice test run. Very excited to talk about XI. It's got a lot of cool stuff coming up. A um, couple of quick housekeeping notes. You should be able to toggle the video and PowerPoint portions of your screen uh, with the middle bar. We're going to close it to close the whole loop. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them. We'll answer to the best of our abilities. Uh, you can type them into the GoToMeeting module, and Ms. Brittany Degler will ask them as time allows. And lastly, but not leastly, we will be recording this webinar. It'll take us two or three days to get it up on YouTube, but we will send you uh, uh, the link so that you can review it or share it with your colleagues. And with that, I welcome Mr. Richard Stout, also making his sixth appearance of the day. <laughs> Thanks, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so if you're the technical angle, yeah. I guess what angle am I here in the presentation? Uh, <laughs> I won't even. <laughs> you know, that's the, this uh, doesn't look good for me, but yeah. that's okay. Um, so, what are we going to talk about today? We're, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about XI, right? We're going to talk about what's new yeah. and cool about 11, and you know what it means for us and you and the market. And what those implications and opportunities are. Obviously, this is this is a release that's in the making, so uh, we're at the very early stages of it. But I think that we can see a great path forward for Infor and the Lawson product. And so we're very excited to start, yeah, you know, the absolutely. conversation. Absolutely, we save the best for last. Yeah. Save the best for last. There yeah. you go. Get you excited about what you can't have. <laughs> All right. So uh, quickly about RPI. Um, if you've been to any of the others, you've probably already seen the slide. Lawson Consulting Company, 40 plus consultants nationwide, full service Lawson delivery. Been putting on these webinars all day. Um, so if you want to check out some of our other resources, uh, look for the YouTube recordings. They'll be up on our on our website. So I think that's, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. XI. So what is XI? Is that is it version 11? No. I I, I think uh, well, it it might be, but um, <laughs> there, uh, the the terminology uh, as we understand today, as, as Infor has been putting out today, uh, there, there's maybe a, a little bit of divergence between what XI is and, and what 11 is. Uh, XI refers to an overall set of design guidelines uh, or or goals for how software should operate. Right? This is what they're targeting. This is what they want to put out is systems that meet the, the, the XI design principles. Okay. 11 is our software version that is XI certified. Right? Okay, but it's, it's not Lawson 11. The term Lawson is, no. is out. Yes, it's, it's FSM 11, well, financial, financial and Supply Management 11, or HCM 11, or HCM 11. Human Capital Management 11. So even though it has this F FSM and HCM tags, we can view these 11s as the next stage in the evolution of the software formerly known yeah. as Lawson. Absolutely. And I, I think it's a very important um, iteration of this evolution because it's really the combination of two things. You have software that's been evolving for 40 years now, um, you know, on, along its own path, mm -hmm. and to that you're adding a very large uh, uh, monetary investment in yeah. development and a very specific uh, set of uh, uh, design principles, yeah. right? So these two are coming together to produce what's basically a very exciting uh, new product. Yeah. Starting first with the Lawson side, you know, I think this, uh, I love this evolutionary transition slide. I've used it a, a few times. Basically, it just looks at the path of going from LSF to Landmark. I think one of the things that we should uh, mention is that Landmark's actually been in development for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, eight years ago, Lawson decided to start developing on a second platform. Um, they didn't want to be on COBOL forever. They sort of recognized that that might not be the way of the future yeah. or the fastest way to produce new uh, a code that could keep up with modern technologies. And they started developing uh, various applications within that, uh, the LTM suite, which obviously uh, uh, had a, a, a lot of success. And, and a lot of rollouts, uh, some in the procurement side, such as contract management and strategic sourcing, and also on the finance side, they're developing, you know, some closed recon, treasury, cash management. 
So, so this has been going on for, for quite some time, and the deployment of these, uh, of these modules allowed them to further develop the software, right, in many ways to make it uh, faster, uh, to understand, yeah. you know, what gaps needed to be the filled. The platform has matured. Has matured. And, uh, and also uh, showed them the, the need to, to sync it up with a LSF right. to make it work currently. It's become yeah. more tightly integrated. Totally. Which is, which is where we are today, and I think when, when Infor comes into the picture, it's about three years now, Lawson's already got one foot, you know, into this next set of the water, and they've developed the new process flow IPA on Landmark, which is it's basically what's creating this this big shift across the Lawson space of Landmark adoption, um, probably at a good stage along the process because now they have yeah ISS. That, that's what's putting Landmark in front of so many customers. It totally is, and uh, but I think that one thing Infor did when they looked at this, you know, they probably said, let's see what's going on here, which way they we're gonna go. They realized, uh, you know. We can't stay in this dual platform strategy long term, right? right. Um, so what they did is they doubled down, right? They said let's go all in on Landmark, and and they invested the dollars to get to this XI Landmark, uh, which is which is where we're going. And, and 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 while they did that, I think the other thing they applied it wasn't just it wasn't just money. It's these guiding principles. Uh, I also like this slide a lot. It's three yeah. very simple circles, right? And, and I just want to take a second to talk about how they affect the development of Eleven and of what we formerly knew as Lawson and, and, and that space. You know, I, I think first and foremost, something we're going to be talking about uh, throughout this presentation is this whole concept of architecture of the internet. And so, yeah. so what that means is, is it's sort of direct, uh, directly correlates to, in some ways, to our presentation from earlier, right? To yeah. to cloud, to cloud, to SaaS, yeah. to being upgrade proof. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a different paradigm from a traditional on-premise client-server application. Totally, yeah. totally. And it means it means ultimately supporting less platforms, yeah. not supporting on-premise. Yeah. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, supporting more browsers, more browser. mobile-friendly. Totally, yeah. totally. And it also means protecting the core code right. from you know everybody going in and. And right. modify stuff that we do all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from uh, us. Right. It, it, exactly. It means keeping the in for code uh, locked down and uh, instead uh, allowing it a layer on top. Uh, totally. Totally. Yeah, to 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 make it different from customer to customer. So I think that long term, you know, one of the things that hurt um, ERPs is the attempt to be something for everybody. Right. The the, the right. whole let's go grab every industry we don't have because there's opportunity there. And I think one of the things that uh, Infor was able to reposition, having such a large product base, mm -hmm. is they're not trying to make Lawson work for manufacturing today, right? They have right. other products that are more mature in those markets that they continue to develop and invest in. And so they look at what is the base that Lawson has, right? Healthcare, public sector, uh, financials, and they invest in those. And they invest in those at a, at a, at a layer uh, even beneath that, right? We, we've seen that. They don't just say healthcare. They look at what do academic medical institutions need? Right. What does K through 12 need? And that's where the dollars are going. So I think that that's a really good thing for the existing Lawson customer base, sort yeah. of recognition of this is where we are. We're going to put our money into further developing what you need. Uh, and this goes all the way to, to BI and modeling out of you know, the business processes and roles. Yeah. When you're looking at an IT strategy uh, for, for software deployment, uh, there's really two schools of thought. You can go with tightly integrated. Let's pull in all the software components that's designed to work really well together. Or you can go with best of breed. Let's shop out each individual yeah. piece uh, to who is the market leader or, or the leader in that type of application, sacrificing that interoperability. And I think the micro vertical suites basically says you don't have to give it's up. It's a combo, right? Yeah. So that they say we're going to take our own best of breeds and we're going to create a tightly knit integration instead of trying to, you know, compete with the concurs of the world by developing something in our right. in our awesome platform, which we know is is just a very difficult thing to do. And the last one is something that I think we're going to see a lot of, which is, you know, obviously beauty I think is a little bit uh, oversimplifying, but but the modern user interface experience is sort of a recognition that the way these things developed, that sort of database centric uh, model and and interoperability to um, to how we experience the world today right. on Amazon and everywhere else, and and it's it's a very important big goal for them, and it, and it's 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 sort of been a leader in how they design things, right? Is what is the user experience here yeah. going to be like? We interact with technology in every aspect of our life, 
why does our interaction with technology at work need to be 10, 15 years behind uh, how we interact with technology at home? Okay, that's not very kind to the old Lawson system, but you know, it's, Sorry. it's developed a long time ago. So let's talk a little <laughs> bit about um, about just sort of this landmark technology, right? So, so, so um, uh, in case it's not clear, all of Lawson, everything that's in LSF and 4GL mm -hmm. is going to move to landmark in version 11. So both uh, the FinPro that's on LSF, COBOL, and the LTM suite that's on landmark today all end up together on the same platform uh, this this landmark technology XI except for payroll which we'll talk about a little bit later but generally the principle is get everything cohesively into this new system and and what are some of the things about this new system that we know here today yeah um, first the, the the user interface here uh, our modern UI our role-based home pages what does that mean uh, we've got a, a web interface that looks, acts, and behaves just as good as a thick line, right? So when you're thinking about portal versus smart office, you have so much more capability for uh, customization, laying out your screen in smart office, really sorting all the tasks. Even though it's web-based. This, right, exactly. The web-based interface of XI brings all that capability that we have with smart office today into, um, into a web interface, and it, and it uses that by basing its layer on HTML5, the, the next generation of, of, of HTML. I think another very important change is that whereas we're used to thinking of you know, forms that access specific tables or table sets, mm -hmm. and then you know, we learn the forms that we need, the, the, the going in here, we're, we're thinking, what is the role of the comptroller in this type of organization, right. right? And what are the tasks they perform, and how do we push those tasks to this default yeah. Uh, role based homepages. Exactly. They've, they've developed these role based homepages for pretty much all the different uh, facets of the organization. I, obviously, we customize it, but it starts out of the box with something that's that's right. fairly ready to go. Based on uh, you know the folks that design this, these are uh, implementation consultants that have been doing this for 20 years, right? They, they, there's a lot of um, intellectual capital that Lawson accumulated that has gone into designing. These some are of the stuff. guys that have put together the buyer cheat sheets. Exactly. The, the, the controller dashboards. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's like what needs to be funneled in front of them so that we don't have to send them to a lot of places or have reports to go look up, you know, hey, I have a message that I got to go address. And I think along with that, there's the security part of it also comes pre-delivered like we see with Landmark today. Yeah, exactly. Where Lawson uh, traditionally has come with, uh, the, you know, roll your own security uh, over on the Landmark side. Everything comes with security inherent. Uh, even when we talk about um, uh, extending and, and developing on the landmark platform, your new uh, creations will come with security. Uh, will come well. with uh, pre-built security. Pre Obviously, security. the configurations you can modify, but yeah. it's sort of a more logical way instead of sort of building that from the ground. It's like, oh, we, you know, afterthought. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me who you want to access what. It's like, well, you develop the software, right? So, right. Not to be backhanded, but I think it, I think it's very smart stuff. You know, I, I think one of the things is um, no tokens, right? Gone are the tokens, and 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 gone are the FC fields, mm -hmm. right? So, so even though Portal was web-based, it still sort of just mimicked what Lib did, right? You're still going and saying, right. you know, this add, change, delete concept. Yeah. FC was such a, an acronym because it's it's basically the user having to instruct the application what type of database query to run or what type of database transaction to run. Well, I mean, they'll still be they'll still be saving data, editing data, deleting right. data. But you won't have to think of it in those. But it will be like terms. like right click, intuitive based. It won't be like these are the three. Yeah. I'm, I won't be filling boxes of it. So, um, I'm excited to get to get to that point there. You know, one thing that I, you've been talking about since forever is uh, is object oriented programming, right? And Landmark obviously embraces object oriented programming. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a good, good time for you to explain to me what the world is. Like, I still don't understand what this object-oriented programming right. is. So the, the, the big difference here, uh, I think, between traditional loss and LSF applications and, and Landmark is where I think of loss in as, as generally a two-tiered application. You've got your user interface layer, and then you've got your database layer. And there's not really that much. That makes much, a lot of sense. Yeah, that, exactly. It makes a lot of sense. It, it, essentially, you are you know, using the interface to manipulate data in the database. Um, Landmark, their whole uh, design uh, is based around more of a three-tiered architecture. 
where you've got this layer of abstraction in the middle. And that means that the uh, user interface can be designed around the particular tasks or, or work that you're looking to achieve, and the user interface doesn't need to bring in design elements based around the data repository. We, uh, the user interface interacts with our business objects in Landmark, and we have a persistence layer that is, you know, uh, 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 just totally separate from our user interface. So that all sounds really smart, right? And, and I'm sure it is. But to me, I, I, all I see is you're adding a middleman, and that's somehow better. And that's somewhat counterintuitive in my layman's uh, eyes. So why is that well, middleman? What is that middleman doing that's adding value there? Uh, it, it means that your um, design of your system isn't constrained by your database. So you no longer have to. Um, I mean, let me think. Of, what's a good example of a screen where you have to do multiple actions on it? AP twenty. Yeah, a AP twenty, where you're clicking through the 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 your work workflow through AP twenty. It's based on the multiple tables, AP invoice, AP distrib exactly. that are involved, AP payment. Yeah. Exactly, wholly based on that that uh, you know master detail relationship on that screen. Why is our interaction with that screen? Uh, need to be in that method when we want to create a whole invoice, not a, not an invoice header and invoice uh, detail rows. So the this business logic layer is that concept of a whole invoice, and the data layer could be that in, that yeah. uh, multi table. I mean the business layer does much more than just create the record. I mean the business layer handles um, routing. Exactly, exactly routing. So uh, workflow basically. So it's looking at at this invoice object and then what happens to this invoice object and not what happens to these individual tables and when you're doing things to report a routing you're always having to go back in Lawson to those to those core tables but with this business object I can do the reports based on that based on that object forget about the database layer altogether. yeah I think that kind of starts to make a little bit a little bit of sense yeah it's you, better you you're sure that it's way better so and it's like it's like it's 15 like, years old right, technology yeah. So. yeah we didn't invent this okay so year. it's good time it's yeah. good time all right um so let's talk a little bit, uh, real quick, about about the apps. You know, and, and, and why are we talking about the apps? Thought I put an extra uh, extra p on that one. I must have <laughs> not saved that. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, one of the things I feel like with 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 ten is you have this uh, you have this uh, foundation uh, change, this technology change, but uh, there hasn't been a lot in it for the end users, right? And uh, you know, when I say what are the about the apps, the apps in eleven, there's to me, a tremendous amount for the end users. Mm -hmm. you know, not only is the user interface going to be more intuitive and better, um, but foundationally, they built this in a way to allow uh, you to uh, uh, modify things on your own. You know, as we saw earlier with Melissa already in the 10.2 HCM apps, where you can set up your yeah. proxy. It's highly um, configurable. Highly, co highly configurable by the end user, by the managers themselves. I think that's an important thing. Yeah. Um, and when you look at things like uh, like IPA and, and process flow, um, the fact is that we lost them. These these were ultimately afterthoughts, so you had to custom build triggers to make those work, right? And here, this is like foundational, like every right. everything from the ground up is built to be like automate me, right? Please. Exactly. Every, everything has every uh, business event has an inherent workflow trigger. Um, Every business, every business event can have a, an image attached. It's got an integrated image. That's true. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And one of the things you look at is, is maybe some of the names have changed slightly. This is sort of the tentative release schedule of of, of, of these apps, you know, being ready, even though they wouldn't right. be GA. So this is yeah. These are the eleven release cycles. So our our first release of the FSM eleven uh, is going to be over the summer, and it's right. going to include these components here. So when we look at these things, they're like, you know, uh, GL, CA, FP. I mean, they're not going to use those names anymore, but there's corresponding for AC. There's corresponding pieces for all this. And, and I think that, I think that you know, a lot of these um, uh, uh, modules, uh, we, you know, when they reprogram them in, in Landmark, it wasn't like they wanted to reinvent the wheel either, right? You still have a requester doing a requisition. There's going to be a program that's going to turn that into a purchase order that a buyer can manage and issue via EDI, via paper, via 
yeah. fax integrator or whatever the equivalent is. They're not is. looking to disrupt every business. They're process. not going to disrupt every business process. There's still going to be handhelds that let you do park counts, right? So, so yeah. conceptually, a lot of the, 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 the business process stuff is in there. However, uh, the two big ones from a FinPro side, at least, and that was very FinPro oriented, was is a GL and AC yeah. are the ones where they spent the time to rethink from the ground up. And I, and I think one of the important things here is the folks that spent time rethinking General Ledger, which they're calling Global Ledger today, uh, were implementation consultants for a long time. And so they spent a lot of time dealing with the various issues that companies face and the workarounds. It's like, you know, why do people use things like strategic ledger? Because they have a secondary reporting needs, right? Yeah. Uh, organizations uh, would have um, different uh, fiscal calendars, right? Uh, that they needed to report on or across companies that they needed to consolidate. Or, uh, uh, yeah, consolidation companies. Consolidation companies. Right. Uh, they would uh, need to use uh, uh, the attribute matrix in order to be able to report on secondary things. Um, uh, handling multiple currencies was always a, a big challenge. And so when they're building this up, they're building this up with that mentality. And you're going to hear a lot about these uh, the, uh, dimensions, right, that you can add on to your GL to track a lot more things at its at its core piece. And, and basically, conceptually, from a from a GL perspective, they've collapsed a lot of these GL subledgers into one, right? Like, yeah. we shouldn't have an SL. We should have a GL that can handle right. whatever dynamic needs you have that can create these different reporting groups um, and can have multiple calendars going on at the same yeah. time for the same company. It's a rethink about how the core structure should work and uh, hopefully designed to eliminate some of the compromises that had to be made uh, when Lawson was completely. in the past. Completely, completely. So um, the question then is, is this a re-implementation? And, and no, it's, it's, it's not a re-implementation, right? Uh, you know, when you look at getting to XI version 11, uh, you're not going to be, you're going to be showing buyers, here's the new UI, but it's going to be the same purchase order, it's going to be the same vendors, it's going to be the same items. Yeah. But you're not retraining your entire organization. You're not going through an entire implementation cycle. But what it is, I think, especially with um, GL, is an opportunity, right? We we already have customers that are doing a rethink of their organizational structure for uh, flexibility, scalability, reporting, right. right? And and when they're doing this, they're still dealing with the old core LSF. So they're still running into some of the limitations that they had when they implemented 1998 uh, and so forth. And and I think that. To me, it's a tremendous opportunity to rethink, hey, you know, this stuff that I did 20 years ago, do I want to rethink how it goes, right? And will that affect, uh, uh, you know, the process with the conversions and so forth? You know, sure. Um, but the reality is that Lawson's, Lawson, if we're also recognizing, some folks might be very happy with what they have, and they'll provide a direct path to collapse all that in and not use any of that functionality. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'd say, you know, is this an implementation? Well, really, what is your definition of a re-implementation? Maybe there, there can be some aspects of the upgrade uh, process to 11 and it, that are really optional, whether or not you want to take advantage of, of rethinking how your system was originally configured. I mean, you right? can really implement a 10. Some people, some people are looking right, at that. Exactly. Right, exactly. I mean, from a, uh, you know, from a technology standpoint as well, um, you know, there, there are elements there that, um, are we building something completely new or different? Are we building off of something that we already have? It's it's hard for me to imagine um, someone building something completely new off of off of everything. Yeah. You know, I think the main area that we're even looking at today that people look at when they do implementations, it has to do it has to do with GL and maybe the GL you know vendor group procurement group relationships. You know, maybe you set that up with many multiples and you want to consolidate. Maybe there's some opportunities around that. You know, I think most people are going to fall. Right around there, and it's going to be a very much a case by case basis. Hey, you know, um, it's interesting. Uh, we should talk a little bit about the HTM landscape. Uh, hopefully, Melissa's around somewhere. Uh, so most of what we've been focusing is on is on FinPro because obviously that's taken a huge step. You know, HCM has already been on this path for a long time. All, the entire LTM suite was developed um, on Landmark. Global HR has been on Landmark for quite some time. And now they have uh, absence management benefits already on Landmark. Mm -hmm. The only one that's staying a little bit behind is is payroll on LSF. You know, I think that's definitely going to move eventually. It's just it's a really big one. It's a, it's a big competitive advantage for Lawson that their COBOL programs can run so fast. Yeah. And I don't think they're ready to let that go, especially for big organizations. You know, if 
if you have McDonald's running your payroll, you know, you, you, you want to keep them happy. Right. Um, and so that volume really matters. You know, I will say that when Infor looks at ACM, there's a lot more than just what we would consider, you know, original loss and stuff plus the new landmark things. There's uh, the HR service delivery, which used to be in Wisen for case management and onboarding. There's a workforce management, basically a Kronos competitor. There's learning management, and there's the talent science, which tracks, you know, behavioral things uh, and success factors within, uh, within organizations. So this HCM stuff, this square right here, um, this is all going to be Landmark 11, Landmark XI. Right. Uh, it's 10.2. So all this stuff is already on Landmark. It's going to be even better, even more improved, but it sort of had a head start on everything else from the FinPro area. Right, absolutely. So um, let's talk about BI. Right. Uh, this is another evolutionary uh, change or incremental improvement from... Um, from, from the current loss in landscape to, to XI, and some of this is already in process, right? Yeah. We already have uh, IBI um, taking over, or, or maybe LB, you could say maybe LBI is growing into IBI. Okay, uh, yeah. so not getting eaten. Mm, only if IBI gets bigger because it's, 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 absorbing. it's, it's okay. assumed everything that's in LBI. Um, so LBI is a collection of various uh, reporting packages or, or BI packages that sort of got wrapped up together to make a, a, a whole solution for dashboarding and reports. And, and, and what are those things are like Crystal you're talking about? Crystal? Right. We're looking at cri yeah, Crystal Reports is the, is the primary reporting tool in LBI yeah. uh, that's you know for report display and distribution. Uh, we have Smart Notifications, which is uh, a uh, mostly used to get email notifications out to get uh, timely um, actionable yeah, information yeah. out. Uh, and then uh, we have dashboards, which is, is provides your web-based interface to, to pull all this stuff together. Okay. Uh, IBI adds in Application Studio. So yeah. this is a product that came over from the Infor side of the house, and Application Studio is going to be the go-forward solution for both reporting and dashboards. Okay. Okay, so more robust solution, yeah. and and already, lost some customers that are in LBI and going to ten dot mm -hmm. four or whatever. Yeah, this is have available. Access to right. Java. So they're, they're starting to roll this out already. This isn't completely dependent on XI, but they are committed to once they go to eleven, and for BI will be the will be the space that's taken over. Yeah. So all those products as they get fleshed out are we're going to see going forward, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be the LBI tool set. Yeah. yeah. Next slide. So um, when we talk about these reports, you know, obviously uh, it's going to be a new database, right? I mean, they haven't, they haven't reinvented the wheel, but they didn't copy every field no. that is in a, you know, item mask right. because so because why would you copy all that junk? Right? What we know about the database in in version 11 is uh, that the table names are going to be different, the column names are going to be different, um, the the reposit the, the the data repository in 11 is driven by the business logic. So it's it the 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 way uh, the developers go about is a little bit different. They don't build the table first and then build the programs to interact with the table. They build the program and let the program decide how to store the data. Okay. Uh, so that that means that what you're going to see is the the data structure can be pretty different uh, going okay. to 11 and and yeah, any existing reports that you might have today are uh, they're going to need to get get changed around. Well, and you're going to need to use them in whatever the new tool is, right? Because because we know that uh, Infor doesn't want to stay with Crystal. Crystal's, uh, is, is, we know they want to use open source, right? Uh, well, yeah. Right? We, we know that Infor is moving away from any uh, third-party licensed products across the whole technology. And, and we know stuff. that open source means not owned by SAP. Right, that's, right. I think, the right. most important the, the factor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so basically, at some point, I'm going to have to rework all these reports in something new. Well, you could. Uh, Application Studio is a pretty amazing reporting product. I mean, we've seen uh, demos of like healthcare analytics. Yeah. I mean, it has some some pretty impressive display. But uh, I, I would argue that why, why you can't take my Crystal reports away from me, right? It's like if I've been I working, with, you can't. If I if I've been working with Crystal for years, if I have Crystal expertise in house, uh, I, I would I would say Crystal works. Wouldn't it be faster to just convert the existing reports and continue developing on that platform than switching? Well, I'm going to have to replace all the the, the, the data 
extraction layer on those reports. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm going to be able to keep all the front end uh, formatting, business logic. Right. What I'm bringing to you. We already know how to use Crystal Reports. Okay. So we might have to have a little wager on, on uh, Crystal Retention versus new uh, new reporting adoption uh, three years down the line. So. Yeah. I mean, certainly there's pros and cons. I mean, I'm not I'm not throwing my lot in with the uh, with the legacy technology here. Uh, okay. I, I think that there's. I well, think Crystal isn't a lagger technology either. I mean, right. you know, there's a reason that it's embedded into LPI, right? Yeah. So, but you know, we have, we've actually seen a lot of people also use uh, Microsoft reporting services to to deliver those things. Yeah. Is that free? Microsoft? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, yeah, aspects of it are free. With, with um, C SQL Server uh, comes with a lot of cool tools, right? It comes with a cool integration engine. It comes with a cool reporting engine. And yeah, we, we have a lot of customers using SQL Server reporting services as an alternative to Crystal. And again, I, I'd say if that tool works now, yeah. It'll work later. It, you, it'll work later. Yeah, you'll have to go through and, re and um, you know, get your reports working under that new schema. But, you know, the effort in creating a report is mostly around uh, working with the business users to design the report uh, to bring the actual information, uh, you know, to the to the screen and, and get your criteria set up and your columns set up and your formulas set up. Uh, once once that effort's done, it's easy to go in and re, you know switch around what tables it hits. So uh, you know, as, as we're talking about this, one thing that is definitely that is is RW100. Yeah. And uh, and uh, we, you know, it's tough because there are customers that 15 years ago. So hundreds of RW100 reports, and they continue to, to maintain them and so forth. But uh, internally at RPI, we consider that a pretty antiquated technology where, where we think that has run its course. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more flexible tools. And the, the argument form, is yeah. that in FSM 11, the, you know, the, the, the capability is baked into GL to be able to get the data out that you need. You, you don't need a, an RW model. So exactly. So I, you know, I think that sometimes with RW100, you have these reports that were copied over, you know, for 100 different departments or whatever. And so you look at, I have 800 RW reports, and it'll take me forever to recreate them. But, but actually, you know, it won't. You know, there's simple spreadsheet tools that you could just be copy pasting worksheets. You know what I mean? Like, right. like it could literally be very fast after you design one. So, you know, nothing against uh, those of you that have RW100, but uh, someday uh, they're going to have to give that up. So, let's talk about a little bit about what else is cool here. Um, we know from what we've seen so far that some of the business uh, cases that we've uh, helped uh, customers overcome mm -hmm. and, uh, by customizing the current LSF are going to be out of the box in, yeah. in, uh, in XI, and we're very excited. And, and just a couple of those, um, we've done this in a few places where basically just a recognition that the requisition approval process for regular goods you might get from the storeroom or a capital approval process is very different and have a very different set of criteria. Right. Different kinds of requesters, different type of transactions, and certainly a different process. approval process. Different approval process. And you know, quick quick workaround for that has been to have multiple entry points uh, to get into RQC, mm -hmm. and then to leverage that to have certain defaults uh, like PO codes, GL accounts, sure. and then trigger other things. You know, this is going to be out of the box and that side. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that's. I think that's great. That's a great opportunity to then roll out a capital approval process right. without having to overlay it on your RQC. Yeah, your many RQC. of our customers have found that useful. It just makes sense that it should be part of the application. Another exciting one is uh, something that actually our colleague, Mr. Deborah, helped program, which is a uh, leave PTO request system, right? So, so this is basically uh, um, an offshoot of self service whereby uh, employees can request uh, time right. off. And a manager can approve it and get visuals of, right. of who else has time off. Yeah, all, to, I mean, a, every organization today has a process to do that, whether whether it's documented or not, right? So it only it's, makes sense to bring it into the office. Not always online. So, right. and you know, th these are a couple that we recognize because we've worked with before. But you know, uh, what what I see is that they went out to the market and said, you know, what is it that you need our software to do? And you know, part of this is aiming at at having it already pre-built, or at least to the extent that you can modify from there. So right. um, I would guess that there's hundreds of things just like this. Hopefully a lot are just as good as these. And uh, it brings us to our next question. <laughs> what about customs? Yeah, what about the customs? Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a, a big part of, of moving to the, the cloud architecture, the software as a service. Um, 
the, the code base needs to be consistent, right? And we, we, we've been hearing a lot about multi-tenancy, uh, you know, in, in mm -hmm. with software as ours, with, with the XI system. Um, that means that the, the basic code base needs to be the same. Every customer needs to be running the same set of code. Uh, that's going to help in for support. That's going to help in for uh, do updates at a, a much faster rate. Um, but what does that mean for customizations? So uh, officially, there are no customs. There are no customs, right? right? Uh, FSM 11 does not support customizations. What does it support? Is configuration. Right. So that's laying over top of Enforce code. There is a rich development environment uh, to control how the application looks for an individual customer. Uh, that's like changing the screens around. Everything that we could do, say, in Design Studio, or extending business classes, adding extra columns on. To, uh, to, a, to, a, to a table, or taking that a step further, adding a new uh, detail record to a master record, so cr creating a new type of record that's a one-to-many relationship to an existing record. So there's a recognition that it's not going to work out of the box for everyone. Everyone's going to have some needs that are specific to the organization, right. and, and, and there's even a couple of little clever ideas about um, Allowing the users themselves to, to create, I guess triggers would be the wrong word, but uh, uh, right, right, yeah. So we've got uh, action requests. Action requests. This yeah. is something that exists today in the in the HCM application. Uh, it's this concept that uh, any any business event or transaction can be tied to a request, meaning I can set up that I want a request. Not just I, I don't want to just allow a user to create a record. I want to allow a user to put in a request for a record that needs to be approved by someone else before that record is created or or before that change is accepted. Right. Right. So I can say I want a pay raise or I want right. a new vendor. Or, and, and what that comes down to is I'm modifying a field on a record, but it's not really changing that record. It's just holding that in escrow until my approver says it's okay, and then we have an as of date when that when that change is applied. That's awesome. That's inherent to to the, the to the system. It's a way to do. Uh, it's a way to set up quickly set up an approval workflow without even going to the IPA designer and actually building on a flow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So some very exciting stuff, right? It's yeah. officially no customs, but still a lot of flexibility. Yeah, there's okay. tons of tons of opportunities. I, I'm really excited about the development environment in FSM. Everything's got a, a, a workflow trigger built in. You've got all this ability to customize screens. Sorry, configure screens. Configure. <laughs> I'm um, get used to that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I'm gonna definitely need to get used to the terminology here. Uh, there are two words that you want to know. Uh, Anything where you're changing the way that the application works uh, out of the box, that's called configuration. Um, configuration, by the way, uh, configuration that's mostly done through the configuration console, which is a part of Landmark today. So if you're running any Landmark apps today, you do have access to configuration console. But uh, configuration console in the current version of the software today right, let's clarify that, yeah. is limited to making changes uh, mm -hmm. to what's already available. Uh, one thing that they made available in version 11 is uh, the ability to do net new development on the platform. The ability to go into the configuration console and create a brand new business class that might not even be connected uh, to any other part of the application. Um, and the, the term for that is extensibility. Extensibility. Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's throw down here. Um, <laughs> So you know, I, I think a natural question uh, for folks that um, has spent time developing some 4GL code, and you know, there's sort of two levels. There's like you know, I I customize half of the BN uh, you know export uh, reports to for my interface needs, mm -hmm. um, and then there's the I built a whole module. I built a whole module in in, in 4GL, and uh, you know meets some internal business needs. So try that click. We're going to go and edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorry. There we go. Bam. So um, my first thing is, how long ago did you develop these, right? A lot, a lot of this code has been, uh, you know, we still get the request to, like, move them over to 10. It's, it's been 20 years. You've been patching them. 
Some organizations, they don't even know what the code does. That's one of the things they say. No, this both is, the business user that requested it and the programmer that developed it are no longer there. Are no longer there. There's not good coding. So, you know, for me, I just, I just think, you know, before you try to convert over this 4GL, you really got to start from the top. It's like, why do I have this customization? What, what is it about my organization that is not within the normal realm of what other folks do? And, and we have seen already that in XI, they've brought in a lot of the things that there were business requirements that people customize. So yeah. maybe it's already there. Start there. Um, then look at the, the process, right? Is, it, is there something in the process that can be reanalyzed here to either lessen the need or you know, um, be more efficient overall? Um, and, 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 and if you still need some custom developments, at, at that point, look at, look at what the tools available to me, right? And those could be tools within the M4, FSM, HCM landscape, like configuration console, or, or the new configuration of the console with the sensibilities. Or they might be outside of that. And then build them. Because if you were building something today, you really wouldn't choose 4GL, right? You, you do that because you have an internal COBOL development staff, um, and you already have a lot of other 4GL code. But otherwise, you would. And <laughs> and I'll take the side uh, of representing your internal 4GL development staff. Um, so in, in answer to your question, why do we have these customizations? Why has your business process diverged so much from all the other lost and customers? I would say, isn't that really what makes your organization unique? I mean, some of these business processes might be your competitive advantage. Uh, you know, why Why is my hospital have to do this process exactly the same as every other hospital out there? Maybe I've found a, a way that's a little bit more efficient, and I've adopted the software to meet my business process rather than, uh, uh, you know, homogenizing or making my business process vanilla to meet the needs of what the software is capable of. If you've done a lot of investment in COBOL, if you have uh, the, the, uh, an application that's solid, that's useful, and a team that's intimately familiar with that code and want, you know, is willing to continue supporting it going forward, uh, you know, why do we have to get rid of it? So, so, so what you're saying is, why not keep LSF on yeah. the side and run your custom 4GL on? Well, that's, what you're, that's what you're saying. Yeah. I, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't work for Infor, so uh, <laughs> I can't make any promises about, about what's capable, but we do know that uh, if you if you own payroll, you will, LSF right. is a integral part of your FSM 11 environment, mm -hmm. uh, and LSF is is your is your COBOL engine. So can that continue to run your COBOL code, especially if it's something like a standalone module or payroll modifications <laughs> or or, pay, right, or payroll modifications? Right. Uh, I, I would I would say you know definitely take a look at that option. Because there's no there's the uh, there is no migration path uh, that's that's been given for these custom code. Sure, models. sure there is. You 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 recreate you recreate you recreate what the system doesn't already give. You. That's the migration. Path. Okay, so that's so that's not a re-implementation. <laughs> that's well, it's a re it's a rethinking. It's an yeah. opportunity. It's an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So just to be clear. Uh, there is no COBOL conversion for custom COBOL moving to FSM 11. Uh, you would you would need to redevelop those in Configuration Console, which yeah. is a, a very very different tool than than 4GL development. Yeah, and could potentially lead to more efficient customizations. Yeah, I mean I, I'm a big I'm a big Configuration Console fan. Don't get me wrong. Okay, you love COBOL. We got we got it on the slide. Therefore, it is true. Stout loves COBOL. Um, so let's talk about the upgrade path, or, or you know, migration path, right? They're gonna right. they're gonna lose the term upgrade for this one because uh, they feel like migration is more more uh, more appropriate. Maybe yeah. you can talk talk us through a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, why is it not a straight upgrade? Because there are some fundamental data structures uh, that that kind of go at a lower level than anything that exists in Lawson today that form the basis for FSM 11. And the, those data structures don't really exist, like, like our, uh, our DECA dimensional uh, GL structure. DECA dimensional, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that, that doesn't really exist today, so there's nothing to, there's nothing to upgrade Great from. Too, right. uh, so 
to get started on the upgrade, um, you know, there, there are some tools available. There's the migration prep kit and the migration wizard that'll walk you through uh, sort of uh, setting that foundation. Um, for example, uh, in FSM 11, buyer code isn't just an arbitrary uh, two-digit code, it's an employee number. Which right? makes so much sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It you, so you tie buyer back to a resource record yeah. uh, in the Super application. Cool. Super cool. Super cool, but that, that it's means... It's not how you're set up today. It's not how you're set up today, and that data needs yeah. to get mapped, right? Yeah. So as, as sort of a prerequisite uh, for getting the, the system up, you need to map out these certain, uh, the, you know, they've made yeah. new correlations here that, that didn't exist before. Uh, so that's where you've got a um, the uh, uh, sort of all the all the pre work that you need to do. Yeah. Um, one one of the things that that's going to produce for you is uh, documentation that that's that shows um, you know where things have moved to. So um, we've seen that that there's going to be a, a crosswalk made available to yeah uh, sort of uh, help help get you from here's how. Uh, this data used to be stored uh, under locks, and here's how uh, we're gonna. How, here's what we're gonna call it uh, under the new, uh, new version. It makes a lot of sense. So basically, they want to uh, m make it easy to do the migration. Obviously, they want to keep yeah. all their customers, but they also want to take you know, take advantage of some of the stuff they put out there, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it's sort of that combination of the two, and and I just I, I feel like um, the, the good thing is there's gonna be I think a lot of return in the and whatever time is invested. In doing these baskets, you are going to get to take advantage of some of the stuff, which is really cool. Yeah, this is where uh, this is sort of directly that spectrum that we saw earlier. I think the, the amount of time and thinking that we put uh, right up here up front is going to is going to set the course for for what you know what your uh, eleven upgrade is is going to resolve in. So I'm excited about Xi. Mm -hmm. um, has a lot of cool stuff. Bring it on. I'm ready to do the migration. But when, when can we get when, it? When can we get it? When can we get it? Right. So, um, what we know right now um, is that their alpha customer, a, a fairly large customer, uh, has a series of go lives scheduled for through the end of this year. Right. So this is going to be the first customer live on 11 mm -hmm. FSM 11, and we know that they are uh, uh, entering agreements with the early adopter betas. Um, I think they have like 12 selected, and they're trying to narrow that field down to, to five or six. And their goal is to is to provision them, to get them started with the system in July. Um, you know, right now they're anticipating it's going to be nine to 18 months because you know they are betas, right? The software's still in. And all those betas are uh, are cloud, right? All those betas are cloud, and and so the betas won't be going live till you know spring of next year of 2016 at the earliest. Um, they're not anticipating this being GA, GA as of now till the fall of 2016, and that will be cloud only cloud as only. well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that realistically, you know, if you want to be one of the first 10 customers to go on this, you're still not starting till the fall of 2016, and it's not going to be a three month implementation cycle at that point. So, so really, this isn't a reality for you until 2017, right. and probably a little bit later. So and that's look, well past end of life for 901. It's well past lot end of life for 901, and you know that's the question we've got a lot. A lot is is why not wait? Well, I mean, you could, you know, if you're willing to to you know mainstream support's going to end here at some point right now. It's yeah. scheduled for for second quarter of 2016, and um, you know if you have it on hardware that's going to last you for for three years, I just I. There probably are some customers where this is an option, but for 99.9%, it's just it's just not going to be realistic. Yeah. Um. I you know I would say move to 10, and so you know, just sort of looking at that um, and what that project uh, roadmap looks like, you know, really getting on 10 is is the way to go. Um. And getting on 10 also exposes you to sort of that first round of of these technologies, right? So you right. get IPA up and running. Uh, that's something to get good at. It's going to have so much, so powerful. Yeah. On version 11, and you know, if you have lost an HR, I, I would take my time with with GHR. Uh, you know, you look at the upgrade; it's uh, it's it's tech intensive, infrastructure intensive, um, you know, migration that really if you have budgeted and planned for for this year. I would get that done, move on. But with GHR, you know, I would set up this the sandbox and let that HR team 
have its time to do the sterilization, do the position. Do, you know, this is very, um, it doesn't have to be very tech intensive for a while. Yeah. And it's, it's good to have that long planning cycle, really sort of figure out where we want to go. And all that's going to transfer directly to, to right. version 11. So you're going to basically take HR and get it prepared to move. And then by the time 2017 rolls around, you'll have, you'll have had an opportunity to do all these things. And then you can look at, okay, let's, let's look at where it's I 11 is. And let's look at, you know, what my right. timeline is to get on that. And, 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 and depending on how much, how much my finance department wants to really reinvent some of the things they're doing, mm -hmm. what, that, what that cycle looks like. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. Excellent, guys. We do have a few questions here. I will just uh, I'll mention one that I think you covered fairly well. Um, if all the FSM apps will be ready in the summer of X, for, for XI, why bother with an upgrade at all? And I think that probably your last slide yeah. covered that. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of two, two different things. things. They won't be generally available, right? <laughs> they won't be generally available. That I, I well, the, I think Infor w is using the term GA, right? I, I think we're seeing that they're calling it GA, but in order to get access to it, you need to be one of those early, you need to be well, in the early not. adopter program and you need to be on cloud, right? Because this yeah. stuff isn't going to be, this isn't going to show up on the product download site uh, until at least 2017. Yeah. And we saw with that diagram of the release cycle, uh, you know, the alpha customer out there is really core GL, right? They're not, they're not. Yeah. Core GL, CB, it's core GL, Cash Ledger, yeah. AP, it, it's, not, it's not our QPO. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Not every module is, is going to drop yeah. uh, this summer. Well, and, 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 I, and I think we just got to recognize that this is all, it's all great stuff. It's stuff that's in development, um, but it's not like the first early adopter that implements PO. It's going to be like, wow, that was great. Yeah. You know, part of what those early adopters are going to do is help them flesh out, flesh out the gaps. So. Yeah. And I think you probably just touched on this uh, indirectly. Do you know if XI will be available for on-premise environments? Yeah. So our understanding is yes. Three platforms. Uh, it will, nice. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, On-premise deployments will support Windows, and uh, as Keith mentioned earlier, Windows is becoming the first uh, first platform supported for for uh, Infor software going forward. Uh, but they will also continue to support IBM AIX as well as Red Hat Enterprise Linux. They will not be support for other operating systems. No HP UX, no Solaris. So far. So, or so far, uh, no support for the uh, for the i series uh, operating system. Yeah. The uh, if you would like to continue uh, to use your investment in AS four hundred hardware, uh, you will need to run one of the supported operating systems on that box. Okay. Yeah, and and, and, and at this point, um, we have not seen a, a, a tentative uh, timeline for when on premise is going to be available. Cloud, cloud no. is coming first. And they're going to make sure that that cloud stuff is solid. And that's not just for doing. XI. I think we're we're going to start seeing those those fi yeah that phased rollout um, probably starting the summer with with version ten uh, products where they will oh, become really? yeah yeah they'll become available for cloud before they become available for download. Okay. And that just helps in for control. Yeah, I, they they're able to to um, you know respond to support cases for customers running on cloud where every environment looks pretty much the same and not have to worry about, well, is the software is only experiencing this issue when our backing database is DB2 on Series I, you know, a, a more obscure configuration. Right. And, and let's be honest, it's not just the, the other hardware and the platforms on obscure configuration. Sometimes the systems that are administered at, you know, various clients on site can have different oh, sure. nuances to them. Yeah, and, look at anything yeah. from a firewall configuration, yeah. uh, operating system patches. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. We have uh, two more specific questions. And uh, last call, uh, if, if anybody has any more questions, we will still have uh, a few more minutes. And this is our last one. So, so go ahead and ask away. First one, what about smart reports? Oh yeah, man. I know we. I, I might have to. Uh, I might have to do a little bit of research on that and see if I, I, I have the information on that. So, uh, for those of you that, that don't know, 
Smart Reports is uh, a, a, a feature that came out relatively recently and it, it allows you to improve the presentation of back office reports. So it's reports that you run from like a 200 job. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cobol. Co Cobol based reports. Um, there's a, a, a new feature called Smart Reports that uh, really, uh, <laughs> it gets it out of that green bar uh, format and into something that looks a, a little bit more comparable to Crystal. Um, I don't know if that carries forward to 11 or, or not. I'll, I'll see if I can find out. Or, or if that need would really exist because there might be other... Right, because obviously, so there batch are batch jobs. Uh, and, yeah. you know, the, if you look at the, all the procurement applications, um, that's you know, pretty much a straight conversion from, from COBOL yeah. to All the, to, all the batch jobs get converted. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, all, all those, the, the, the the token uh, n numbers are removed, but the, the screens remain the same. Open purchase right? order or listing. Yeah, I I exactly. So those reports still exist. Um, you know, d does the format mimic uh, you know what it looked like uh, in a traditional loss? Doubtful. And I'm not. I'm not yeah, sure. Doubtful. Very doubtful. Very important. That's one of the core tenets is beauty. Yeah. Okay, and last one at this point, and this could be a trick question to qualify whether you're still awake enough to. Uh, celebrate Cinco de Mayo tonight. Though not a customization, we use a PR35.2 user exit. Will such a thing still exist? Uh, yeah, so there are user exits uh, in, just in, in general, um, that's one of the capabilities, the, the configuration capabilities in Landmark applications is they continue to build in, uh, you know, hooks where you can you can insert in your own code uh, to happen, you know, before or after a an, uh, you know a bit of info code running in a transaction. So I, I don't know specifically. Um, well, PR35 is going to stay on LSF, right? What's PR35? It's PR. It must be payroll, right? Exactly. So, so I think that might have been the, the trick part right. of the question. But but but, but, good but, in general, but so conceptually. Yeah. There will be equivalence to this in the, right. in the landmark XI. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. And the landmark is, a, is XI even though the apps are 11, right? Um, I, I, <laughs> 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 that, I might have to throw that question out to Ashley uh, because I, I think we have um, a, a landmark 10.1.1 server with HCM 11 apps installed in, internally here. They might continue on with the numeric... Okay. Um, versioning scheme for, for, for the platform. Okay, just at the, at the Winter Showcase, we saw them use the term XI with yeah. Landmark, so that's why. I, was I think if there's one thing we've learned over the past year, it's that the, the naming is the very dynamic. Will change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so don't, don't get married to these, yes, uh, yeah. to these terms. Yes, true that, true yeah. that. And that's it. I'll hand it back to you guys. Hey, well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time this afternoon, uh, and we hope you have some good plans for uh, Cinco de Mayo tonight. We certainly do. Uh, all these webinars will be recorded, and they will be sent out to all of you, so enjoy your day. Thank you much. Salute.